Well, we're going to uh, enter into a time of worship here this morning. I wanted to encourage you out of a scripture here uh, just before we do. Uh, oftentimes we can, it uh, uh, takes us sort of a while, about two or three songs maybe to really get into it. I just want to encourage you on the power of our worship. There was a time in uh, Israel's life that uh, there were like too many enemies and they just simply said this prayer. We don't know what to do, but you do. You know, sometimes simple is good. We don't know what to do, but you do. And then a word of the Lord came and said, hey, this isn't your battle. This is battle belongs to the Lord. And then all of a sudden, Jehoshaphat began to worship God. And then he called the minstrels. And he called the minstrels like we have with us today. Uh, and he says that they should praise the beauty of holiness as they went before the army of God. The warriors didn't go out. The worshipers did. Yeah. And, and I want to call you to the front lines today that it's not this worship team that's going to break the battle for you it's you as you join in as you worship and it says this now when they began to sing when they began to sing and praise the Lord set ambushes and destroyed the enemies when they began to sing when you begin to sing when you begin to praise the Lord, when you begin to step in, and I encourage you, don't wait for the second, third, fourth song. Step in right now. And, and let me just tell you this, the word praise, you're going to love this. Well, maybe not. But the word is in the Hebrew is yada. And yada simply means to throw your hands in the air like you just don't care. Seriously, throw your hands in the air like you're throwing rocks or spears at the enemy. Can you get a picture of that? You, when you stand and you lift your hands, spiritual things take place. It's like you're throwing rocks at the enemy. Satan, I'm throwing something at you. Enemy, principalities, oppression, depression, suppression, whatever kind of pressing is going on, I'm fighting against you and we're pressing it back. I encourage you as you stand this morning, as you begin to worship God, press in. God saying, you, when you begin to praise, God sets the ambush. How many think that's pretty cool? That's pretty cool. Come on, let's stand up here this morning, Lord. We are part of your army. We are worshipers, and we're here, oh God, to press against the gates of hell. And God, we thank you. You set ambushes for every man, every woman, every family, every marriage, oh God, that is struggling today. You want a war on their behalf. But it says, at, when they began to worship, God, you set ambushes. We bless you. Thank you. King is alive. 
darkness makes us whole And you shoulder our weakness And your strength becomes our own But you're making me like you You're clothing me in white Bringing beauty from ashes For you will have your bride Free of all her guilt And rid It's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my
time, church. In this last song we're going to sing together, um, I just believe that um, revival is happening right now. And revival starts with us. It starts with choosing to seek God in the in the moments. And this next song, we're going to sing about the Holy Spirit. And this morning, we're starting with praise and we're ending with praise. So I want to encourage you this morning to lift your hands, to welcome the Holy Spirit into where you stand. Whether you're standing this morning in the gym or whether you're standing in a kitchen or in the living room this morning online, we're going to start with praise and we're going to end with praise. And welcome the Holy Spirit. So let's sing this out together. Come on, signs and wonders, signs and wonders from Spirit, oh Holy 
God, that's our heart, that your praise would ever be on our lips. God, nobody else gets the praise. No one else gets the glory. We can't boast about anything, but God, only you deserve the praise, the glory, the wisdom, the strength, everything, oh God, we, we give to you today. And God, that, that worship song, it was a prayer asking the Holy Spirit to consume us. Let the fire of God consume us. We hold nothing back. God, let no area of our life, oh God, be untouchable. By your presence, oh Lord, our, our mind, our character, our attitudes. God, how we walk this earth, oh God, how we treat one another. But God, also how we are consumed by your fire for prayer, for worship, to give our lives to you, Lord. God, consume us, we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Well, praise God. Great to be in the house here this morning. Just look around and just wave at somebody, get some eye contact. Let people know that behind the mask there is somebody there. This is the our new version of the Masked Singers. We're here to worship God, amen, in spirit and in truth. Great to be in the house. I love the exhortation that our worship team brought, not just in song, but just that revival that starts with us. It starts with us. You know, we want to see a revival here in our city, in our community, in our neighborhood, in our family but it starts with us. Is the revival in us? And we say, God, let it start here. Let it be in me, in my words, in my actions, in my attitudes. Well, if you're new in the house here this morning, my name is Jeff Harm, the lead pastor. Great to have you with us visiting. My wife, Lori, down in the front row here and our team, we've been at this for about five years, just loving the community and loving being a part of this community of faith and enjoy worshiping God together. Just a couple of announcements. I um, want to remind you uh, of our tithes and offerings as we give unto the kingdom of God, the investment, the return, ROI, for those that are in the business, return on investment. I tell you, it's eternal, it's supernatural, but it's also uh, being able to see hearts and lives changed through the gospel message. And uh, so we also give in areas our finances. And let me just stop you right there. There's a, uh, many of you, you should have received a letter. Uh, just talking about uh, a little change that we're having here. Um, you can still give and uh, your tithes and offerings as well as even now uh, register for these events because uh, we need to find a, a, a mechanism to register. But you can do that on our website directly now because we've incorporated uh, a program called Church Center. Now, for many of you, Planning Center, you're uh, familiar with that, how our volunteers and uh, leaders are all uh, scheduled for activities and different things like that and how we sign up. But it also has another program called Church Center where we're also able to amalgamate, as it were, um, our calendar, our ties, our offerings, as well as our registering for these events. And we're able to combine it all in together. And it's actually an app that you can also have, not just on your website, on your computer, but also on your smartphone. So on your way over here, it's a church app. Uh, once you've signed in once with your details, uh, you can not only can you give, but you can also register on your way over. You go, man, I forgot to register. Well, it's on your phone. It's just an app. You just press a button, uh, and you go in, and you just say, I'm going to be here, or my wife, my husband, my kids, whoever. It's all really simple. It's a simplified system once you've signed up. So uh, just want to let that know. That is starting not this Sunday today, but the 14th is when we're trying to roll it all out. So information has come by email. It's in the newsletter, and uh, the you can contact Sarah directly if there's any questions about it, or we can show you very simply with the app that you can get for Android or for, uh, for Apple products as well. So just want to say that. Uh, let me just also draw your attention to... Um, how we can pray for you. We want to pray. Prayer is so important in this house. Um, we can't do anything really um, without prayer. Prayer is our connection with God, that God allows us to get the mind of the Lord and his, his power and strength 
uh, how can this church function? Well, it starts on prayer. So we want to hear from you. We want to pray for you. We want to remind you that uh, every Sunday morning before service at 930 to 950, we have pre-service prayer where we just set an attitude of faith saying, God, to touch people, let your word just ring out and minister to lives. But we also have another program that has taken place, and that is a prayer walk that is happening for the ladies of the house. And, uh, and the coordinator of this is uh, uh, Karen Thiessen that is just here. You're going to just stand up and wave. And she would love to hear from you. And what it is is just people of faith saying, hey, we want to walk together in agreement, um, listening to God for scriptures, for your own, uh, as you begin to pray out over the area, uh, the highways, the byways, the sidewalks, the alleys, just praying for families, for marriages, for homes. We just want to soak this area in with prayer. Prayer makes a difference. So uh, we do have the time and date up on the screen here, Tuesdays at 7 o'clock, and I believe you're just meeting out front here. And uh, so come, be ready, ladies, and, and just if you have the time, come on out, and because prayer makes a difference, amen? Amen. Um, what do we else we have for announcements to want to say? Hey, we're continuing with the Bible in a year. Uh, this is so, so awesome. Some, some are more diligent than others in making comments. And I just want to say those that are making comments on the app through the uh, uh, just getting some revelation and what's God speaking to your life, I appreciate it. I love reading about other people. And they say, well, well how come you're not putting it in there? Well, because I'm not that good, all right, <laughs> writing it out there. But uh, just keep doing it, and I really appreciate those that are, are part of the uh, Bible app program. We're really looking forward to that. And I don't believe there's any other announcements, is there? No. All right. Book of Ephesians. I am just loving the book of Ephesians. I hope, I hope you are too, uh, but I also hope that you're enjoying the, uh, the preaching of the word. Uh, we're in our, our third message here dealing with um, this beautiful message of uh, what God has for us. And uh, I, I just want to say that as, as we're looking at it uh, through this, the title of, of this series is This Is Us. When we look into the Word of God, but now we're into the book of Ephesians, this isn't just a book, that a letter that Paul writes to the church at Ephesus that was written for the churches not only of Ephesus but of Asia Minor. It's a word for us. And I really felt that the Lord wanted to encourage us as we look at this uh, beautiful letter that we look and peer into it and we say, God, this is us. This is who we are supposed to be. This is what you're calling us to be uh, in this area. And, and, I, and I really believe that, that God wants to stir this church as we uh, make our way through uh, not just COVID, but make our way through various tensions that are in the earth today, that as we prepare for coming out of COVID or what the new normal is going to be, we're going to be ready because this is us. We know who we are. We know what God's called us to do, what God wants us to be like as a church, as the Pearl Church. And uh, um, just by way of review, uh, chapter 1, he, he begins starting off talking about us being in Christ. 35 times he uses this phrase, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. That when we come into a relationship with Jesus Christ and we come into salvation, we become positioned in Christ. We are there, in fact, by God's grace, we are now in Christ. And that 35 times he talks about this, and, and he begins to outlay for us in chapter 1 that everything we need, everything we need to live a spiritual life, walk in success, and the purposes of God is found in Jesus Christ. It's in him. What do you think you have lack of? It's in him. What do you need more of? It's in him. Right now with the world going on, how do we deal with the circumstances and situations? It's in him. And if we will draw from the wealth of who he is, the vault that has been made open to us through prayer and through worship, through access to God, God says everything you have need of is in him. And he goes on with the many possessions, and uh, just very quickly, he talks about us who are saints, and he says we have this thing called grace and mercy. Grace is where we uh, get what we don't deserve, and mercy is where we don't get what we do deserve. But he says out of that grace and out of that uh, mercy, then comes peace. And he says you're chosen, you're forgiven, you're blessed with every spiritual blessing, chosen to be holy without blame, adopted, forgiven, brought into unity. And then the Holy Spirit comes and seals us with the authority of God, with the possession of God, and then the Holy Spirit comes and becomes a guarantee, a deposit that he's coming back for us. We have confidence to live as believers in this world, knowing Christ is returning and he's coming back for his own. And really, who doesn't want to be in Christ? When you look at what God offers us, 
As we look up, open the word, and as we begin to take it in, and then we share it with others, it's like, who doesn't want to be in Christ? Because everything that we have need of is found in him. But here's the thing. It doesn't matter where you are geographically, where you are physically. You can be in Ephesus. And Ephesus was the center of immorality and idolatry and pagan worship and uh, this worship of Diana. Uh, There was greed. There was philosophy. There was uh, intelligence and all these other things that made up Ephesus. He says, you can be in Ephesus, but you can be in Christ. You can be in Christ no matter where you are. You might be in university right now, but you're still in Christ. It doesn't matter where you are geographically. It doesn't matter if whatever dream you're pursuing after, you're still in Christ. You can, believe it or not, be in politics and still be in Christ. You can be in any situation of life that God pulls you into, and you can still be in Christ. School, recreation, activities, it doesn't matter where it is. When you are born again, a born-again believer, that trumps wherever you are. And that's why it's so great when I have opportunity, and many of you have traveled to the nations and perhaps on a mission trip somewhere, when you get around Christians, it doesn't matter the language and doesn't matter the culture. There's something that trumps it all. You're in Christ. You have the same spirit. It doesn't matter whether you look the same, talk the same, or anything. There's something that draws us together. It's the fact that we share the same possessions. We share the person, person of Jesus Christ. We are in Christ. And I believe that it's just to understand that whatever we think we lack, we have the one that we can go to because we're in Christ. It's all available for us. And Paul encourages us that we shouldn't just in this passage know about God, but we are called to know him. He says that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, he says. He says that there would be a flash bulb that goes on. It's like an aha moment. You just don't know about God. If something happens, you know God. You know him intimately. See, when we're in Christ, we're drawn into this love relationship. This romance begins to work deep in our hearts, and we begin to know him more and more. And all of a sudden, we become intimate with him. All of a sudden, we begin to realize that we're so vulnerable, we're so open. We're not hard-hearted, we're not selfish, we're not anything that's holding us back anymore. We're just driven into this beautiful relationship where we get to know God for ourselves, not just because we heard about him. Not just because mom and dad said something about him, but all of a sudden we walk away that we go, aha, I know exactly who he is. And because I know who he is, he shares with me the why of my life. We come to know our calling. We come to know, why am I here on earth? Why didn't God not just have me uh, be born and born again and take me to heaven? He says, I've got a purpose for you. I've got a reason for you. And when we come into that relationship with God, something settles in our heart and we go, I know why I'm here. I don't even know my why. I also know the how, because God's going to give me power to do it. I'm not on my own. And chapter one is that nailing us down in our relationship with God as believers. You see, before this is us, we come become us. We come into this relationship where of a community of, of believers, and wherever you're on your journey, whether it was a yesterday that you just came into knowing Christ, or you've been knowing Christ for 30, 40, 50 years, we all come in together. And he begins to draw us into a a right relationship where we understand that that God is calling us together. And that's where chapter 2 comes in. In chapter 2, he says, "Uh, let me just tell you a little bit about you. And he's like, well, no, you talk about somebody else. Don't talk about me. But no, God, Paul says, I want to talk about you. And just in case you think you had anything to do with your salvation, in case you think you're righteous or you've got anything good in you, Uh, Let me just explain something. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. He starts off right away. He says, hey, just to let you know, when you came into all this, you were dead. And dead has no life in it. Dead has no ability in it. Dead has nothing in itself. You can't resurrect yourself. You need somebody outside of you to resurrect you, and that is only Jesus Christ. But while you were dead in your trespasses and sin, God came and quickened you and made you alive. You have nothing to boast about. Salvation is a gift. Nobody can buy it, earn it. Nobody can all of a sudden bequeath it to you. Nobody can uh, uh, give it to you, and you can't do anything in your own efforts to get it. It is strictly a gift from God. You had nothing to do with your salvation. And uh, Christ's death came and did this, but can I tell you it did something more? And this is what Paul does in chapter 2, and we talked about this last Sunday. 
God did not just through Jesus Christ's death make you alive. He came and tore down the wall of separation between you and the person next to you. Between the Jew and the Gentile, every division, every separation, every act of racism and hatred and enmity, every situation that would be drawn between people, Jesus Christ's death on the cross tore down the wall. And that's where only Christ can bring about complete unity. Only Christ and his death can bring us into a oneness where we can function together as one. Until then, it's, it's human standards and human rules and human laws that are struggling and fighting to get everybody together, but it never works because there's not that foundation of unity that comes only through Christ. Through his death, through his burial, through his erection, Jesus Christ came and he tore it down. And then it says that he went and preached peace to those that are far off and those that are near, those that are Jews, those that are Gentiles, those that are steeped in sin, those that only had a little bit of sin, those that are, are sensing that they are so far from God because of all their mistakes of life and those that say, seem that they, they are close. God says, I preach peace to everybody because everybody needs to be reconciled. Every one of us, he preaches peace to the young, to the old, to the male, to the female, to the rich, to the poor. And this peace brings us into right relationship with God, but here it is, right relationship into one another. I so look into this book of Ephesians in chapter 2, and I go, that's us. Lord God, that, that's us. That's what you've called this church to be. Not just a, a group of people that came out of the graveyard, now alive, but all of a sudden we come into a community Individuals raised from the dead, now we're a community of faith, of believers, that we function together as one. We are now without separation, no hatred. We are simply brought into right relationship. We are one. And Paul goes on and, and begins to talk about this unity, and he gives us three beautiful pictures at the end of chapter 2. And he simply says this, we are one nation. We're the kingdom of God. We have one God, one Lord, one baptism, one spirit. We're, we're underneath one, the canopy of one, the, the God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Spirit, now rules and reigns over this kingdom of, of light, and we're all part of this new nation, Jew, Gentile. It doesn't matter, slave or free. It doesn't matter who we are. We're all one now. And then he says, you're one nation. Then he says, one family. Getting a little intimate. I don't know if I like everybody that's in my own family, let alone somebody else that's going to be added to my family. But through Jesus Christ, he says, we're part of one family, God the Father. We got one Jesus Christ that we're co-heirs with. We look around at each other now, and we, we don't see division amongst us. We see the Spirit of God. I love how Paul says, we judge no man after the flesh. We don't judge in the natural anymore. It's all about the spirit realm. So we come together to help and to fight for each other and encourage each other and defend each other because we're part of one family. And then he says we're one temple, one church, one church at large, all the universe, one church in Christ, but we're one church here, the Pearl Church. We walk in unity. And that's chapter 2, and then now we get into chapter 3, and he takes chapter 1 and chapter 2, and he pulls it all together. And he says, let me just explain it in this word. He says, that was a mystery. That supernatural working of God, bringing Jew and Gentile together, bringing all people from all nations of all time together into one, that's a mystery that's now revealed by the Spirit of God. Chapter 3, verse 1. Paul writes, and he says, 1 through 7, he says, For this reason, chapter 1 and chapter 2, For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the administration of the grace of God which is given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I've br briefly written about already, by which you have read and which you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body, partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. Chapters 1 and 2, he says, you might not know this, he says, that was a mystery. 
Now, a mystery is not something that is a sacred secret that, you know, all of a sudden you've got to hide it, got to keep it from everybody, you know, like some religious and cults and stuff like that, you know. We're just not going to tell everybody what's really going on because we want to control them. So we're going to hold back the truth from them. And that way there are minions and we can just control them. No, Paul says, hold it now. No, that's not the mystery we're talking about. The mystery is a truth that God wants to reveal. But in the dispensation or in the stewardship of time, the Spirit of God had to reveal it. And in the Old Testament, it was, it was held back, as it were, waiting to be revealed. The mystery is this, verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ through the gospel. That's the mystery. That everything that has taken place right then after the death of Christ all the way through to where Paul was and we read about in the book of Acts and Peter and his revelation of Cornelius and, and the inclusion of the Gentiles and all this, the mystery was just being unfolded, unfolded, unfolded. And it's like, what? You mean salvation to the Jews is now also to the Gentiles? Mystery revealed! And you and I now have the revealed mystery. Paul starts off and he says that he's a prisoner. He says, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Again, he's not a prisoner of Caesar. He's not a prisoner of Rome. He's not a prisoner of the guards. He just told us everything's in Christ. In Christ trumps everything. So for Paul, even being in prison wasn't about being a prisoner of the natural circumstances. He was a prisoner of Christ. He was chained not to the guards, but he was chained in his heart to the call of God. He was a prisoner. And Paul saw wherever he was, he was belonging to, to Jesus chained. And then he says, as a prisoner for the sake of the Gentiles. Everything he says that I'm called to do was not for me, it was for others. And he says, it wasn't just for others, it was for people that didn't look like me, talk like me, didn't believe like me, didn't have the same background as I. I'm Jewish, they're Gentile. My culture says I have nothing to do with them, but the love of Christ says, no, you have everything to do with them. Because they too are in Christ. And he says, this is who I am. And then he says this dispensation, which is a business word. This business word means law of the house, which other word be stewardship. This stewardship was given to me. What Stewardship of what? You, you're responsible for somebody else's something? Yeah, the revelation of this mystery. He says, I, I became a steward. So I'm a prisoner. Now I'm a steward. I'm responsible for this thing that the mystery that came by revelation that's accompanied by God's power, I'm supposed to tell everybody else about. And that is the call of you and I. God's not calling us to be Paul. God's calling us to be us with the same calling, that we become stewards of this now mystery revealed, that we begin to share it with other people. This mystery... It was always in God's heart. God did not change his mind. He says, oh, well, you know, I'm sort of, ah, the Jewish nation wasn't working out, so I'm just going to include everybody. No, it was always God's heart. God's heart was always, we, re we read in the Gospels, uh, you know, that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We read in Scripture that, that, that it's, God desires that none, none would not be saved, that all would come to the name, uh, knowing of Christ. But in the Old Testament, we read that it was, as it were, under the law, hidden. But now, by the Holy Spirit, it was revealed. And it made it known. And Paul says, I am a ministry of this revelation. And I believe in God's calling us to be like Paul, to be prisoners, to be stewards. And then he calls himself a minister, uh, which is a servant. I'm a servant. Because we need to get the message out. This new revelation that comes to Paul that's now ours it's not to be a mystery anymore. It's not for us as this little clique that we all of a sudden just hold it within the walls and confinements of this church. And we say, hey, we got the mystery. Shh, don't tell anybody. We got it. No, Paul's holding it now. No, no. The idea of this mystery is not to be held secret. It's to be revealed. It's to be made known that everybody would understand what's going on. And what this mystery that made known by revelation now being in Christ, there's a, there's a promise of this mystery. And here's the promise of this mystery. The promise of the mystery is that salvation is available to everyone. And you should be saying, thank God, right about now. Because that means you. 
That means your forefathers, or that means the next generation. It's for everyone. The mystery is that the gospel, the good news of Jesus is for everyone. The angel said in the night that Jesus was born, behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy that will be for all people. For God so loved the world, it's for everyone. Now, let's put this in context. Paul's writing to the church at Ephesus and the church of Asia Minor, but particularly in the church of Ephesus, there was a culture of tension. There was tension going on. There was tension within the religious community with, with Diana and all of a sudden the, the words of Christ being pro projected out through the city that people were getting saved and giving up their idol worship. There was tension taking place. There was tension between the rich and the poor. There was tension between the politics and the army. There was, there was tension going on between the slave owners and the slaves. There was tension constantly within that city. And all of a sudden this mystery gets revealed that everyone is loved. That everyone is valued. That everyone can have a relationship with God. That everyone comes at equal footing at the, at the foot of cross and then comes into the, equally into the inheritance of Christ. And all of a sudden, into this tension-filled culture, hope comes. And isn't that what we got going on today? And isn't the answer for the tension that's going on today, the hatred, the anger, the anxiety, the animosity, the political and the racial and the governmental and the politics and all these things, what's the answer to the tension today? The mystery being revealed that everyone is loved by God, that everyone can come into the fullness of God's purposes and plans, that everyone is valued and loved. The promise of the mystery is God unites everyone. God comes and brings us all into this unity. Paul says that what God has done for us, you and I, he's doing for everybody out there. And that all of a sudden puts you and I in a precarious situation because the Lord's asking you, what are you going to do with it? You know the mystery now. What are we doing with it? And as we look at this book, we say, well, this is us, or it's supposed to be. So how do we line up to this is us? How do we line up to what God is calling us for? Well, we read a little further that he says in Christ, this mystery of the gospel. Watch this. He uses three words, and I believe we've got to have this in our heart. It becomes motivation to us. He says that for the Jews and the Gentiles together, he uses these three words. You know, Paul was good at this. He made up words. He made up words, words that were never really in the vernacular of the time. He made up words. He'd take Greek words, put them together, and, and, and because he wanted to share what his thoughts were, and he comes up with these words. He uses these words. We have them translated fellow heirs, fellow members, and fellow partakers. Because the point he's trying to get across is that we're all inheriting together, we're all belonging together, and we're all sharing together. And all of a sudden, it changes our heart and motivation because it's not about me anymore. It's about us. It's about we. But then it's broader than we. It's us out there. God, you're calling them to be part of us. Well, just a minute, Lord, I, I, I'm not too sure if I want to really share my table with somebody else that I don't really know. And God says, well, that's what I did. And I want you to do the same. Share it. Open up. Include. Bring them along. And then when Paul explains, he says, well, what's to be done with this mystery? Now, now this mystery comes available to us. What's to be done? He says, what's not to be done is don't keep it secret. Elsewhere, Jesus would say, you're a city set on a hill. You're a lamp set on a table so that all in the house would see it, so all in the nation would see it. He says, there's something about our response that we need to be those that make it available, that it's not just for us. Then he goes and explains this further in verses 8 to 12. He says, to me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages, he says, has been hidden in God who created all things through Christ, Jesus Christ to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to all the principalities and powers in heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he had accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord in whom we have boldness and confidence with access with confidence through faith in him. This promise of the mystery of all included, this promise has a purpose. 
I want you to get this. This this grace, this revelation of the mystery isn't to be kept secret. Paul says, I've got to preach it. Well, no, just show it. Did you know when it comes to evangelism in the Bible, the word preach is never about actions, it's about words? People say, well, you know, uh, when you can't talk about it, you show it. At least you can show it. Well, yeah, our character should be showing Christ, but it's also about explaining it, telling people, sharing the word of God. We're to preach it, speak it out, share it. And the mystery is all about these unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. And when you begin to think of the wealth that you really have, why are you not sharing it? Why am I not sharing it? It's that, God, I got so much. The unsearchable riches of Christ. You think about that, unsearchable means uh, unestimatable, uh, immeasurable, unfathomable. You, you cannot fathom the depths of all the riches. You can't get into all the riches that God has. You can't measure it. it it's so extensive. That it's beyond. It blows your mind when you think about what all you've God's given you. And you go, why am I not sharing this? Why am I not telling other people and making them part of this? This world is, is dark, waiting for answers to the tensions of racism and politics and division, families being broken up, marriages being disassembled and people cast away and lives thrown to the side and they need answers. We've got the answers. Lord, we've got the answers. We've got to be those that share it and show them and tell them, bring the light that, that we have our purpose as believers is to make it available. You know, people today, and to some degree, I, like you, I get tired of watching the news because it's all so negative. Now, is there fake news out there? Sure. Is there untruths out there? Sure. But here's the truth. The weight of the world today is getting heavier and heavier. That whether it's real or not, it's heavy. People are being bent underneath the weight of this situation. They are despondent and discouraged. They, they are disillusioned with life. They're not too sure if they can make it. We, at times, we're not sure. And we need somebody to come alongside and say, hey, you can do it. You're, you're going to be okay. Here's a scripture. Here's, here's an encouragement. Here's a song for you. And we lift each other up. But the world today is under so much tension. And we've got the good news. We've got the good news. We've got the unsearchable riches of Christ available that everybody can get something. It, this is the most divine Oprah moment ever for you and you and you and you. Whatever you want, I got it for you, Jesus says. And everybody walks away with something. Because that's what God has for us and through us. And you don't have to do it alone. And here's the great thing. This is, this is us. Because it's not, this is you. This is us. We do it together. We do it as the body of Christ. We do it as, as those that are fitted in and drawn in to the nation, the body, the, the family, the church. We're, we're all part of this together. So we do it. We march together. We carry it together. We encourage each other together. We're part of this together. We go, this is us. It's not, this is you. This is us. We're, we're all part of this great calling. Notice me. Verse 10, it says this, to the intent or the purpose or the realization that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. The purpose that we, the church, would make known, the manifold, the multicolored, the, the variegated, just the, the, the incredible spectrum, as it were, of the wisdom of God. In chapter 2, we saw that we who were once dead were made alive. Thank you, Lord. But it wasn't so you could live independent, just me and Jesus. No, how's, how's your walk with God? Oh, it's me and Jesus. We are just doing great. Well, how are you doing with the family of God? Me and Jesus, we're doing pretty good. <laughs> well, no, we're called to do this as a family together alongside each other. The, 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 the graveyard reunion becomes a community of faith because we're all that we're dead and now made alive. We've got purpose, and we do this together. We're brought into this union and fellowship. And God's plan from the beginning was that we would become a church, a community of faith, a body of believers. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 22 says this, God gave him, Jesus, to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And I, I don't know if you caught this, but 
Here's, here's what just happened. God says, see the Godhead over here? The fullness of the Godhead? I'm going to take the fullness of the Godhead and I'm going to put it in Jesus. Because Jesus, my son, is going to go to earth and he's going to reveal himself, but not himself. He's going to reveal himself, the Godhead. When you go to Christ, you see the Godhead. The fullness of God is in Christ. But then Paul says, God took the fullness that's in Jesus and put it in the body, you and I, the church. So the very fullness of the Godhead that's in Jesus, God took in Jesus and gave it to us. We are now the body of Christ, the fullness of him. So now when we, as the church, this is us, it's not us anymore, it's Christ in us. Well, just a minute, Pastor, I thought you said we're in Christ. We are in Christ, but it's Christ in us. And because we're in Christ, now the fullness of God that's in Christ is in us as the body. So now when we as the church function in the earth, it doesn't see the misfits that we all are in reality. He sees the redeemed. He sees the sons and daughters that have come through Christ and are now carrying the fullness of God. Together, that's you and I. He took that fullness. And the question is, how are we doing as a church? How are we doing? How are we doing loving one another? How are we doing showing the love and compassion that God has for us? How are we, how are we doing and not just caring for one another? How are we doing caring for those that are our enemies? How are we caring for those that have hurt us and offended us? How are we doing as the church? And that's where it's constantly you and I, every Sunday, we come and go, God, how am I doing? Okay, I better do better. Yeah, okay, I see that. And we come in worship, and we come in prayer, and we begin to say, God, how do we do better? Yeah, okay, now this is us. And all of a sudden, we take into another step, another level, as it were, another reflection of God in his grace, how we reach other people. But listen up. We just don't do that for people around us. We go, we're on display to the community. Yes, we are. But we're on display for a bigger audience. And when you read this scripture, it just, just doesn't blow your mind. It, it begins to cause you to shake in your boots. Look what it says here. Verse 10, we we're, we're now have another audience. As we gather, as we worship, as we pray, as we came together today, it says we're put on display, verse 10, to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. Angels, demonic beings, principalities, all, all of God's created angelic beings watch us. Not just those online. I'm talking about those in the heavenly, those that are part of the, the fallen angels, those that fell with Satan, the demonic host, all those that are part of the minions of, of Satan's kingdom, as it were, that, that, that are active and moving and, and are constantly the, the fray that is going on, they watch the church because the church reveals, manifests the wisdom of God in the earth. So every time we get together as a church, you know what happens? The dark realm looks down and begins, oh my goodness, I can't believe the church is still functioning. That means our days are getting shorter. See, they know where they're destined to. And every time we get together and we worship, every time we share together, every time we pray together, every time we get the word going, when we reach out in evangelism, when we reach out to the mission field, when we reach out as a church and do something beyond ourselves, the enemy, the darkness, the Satan and the angelic beings that are fallen, they look at us and they go, oh, it's still happening. Then they have those that are around the throne of God. Those that are there crying out, holy, 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 holy is the Lord. They begin to cry out to God, and then they begin to watch, watch the church. When you guys worship, when we come together, it's like they peer over the banister of heaven, and they go, look at that. Man, look at that. They're worshiping. They're lifting their hands. They're praising God. They're, they're calling out. They're, they're saying amen to the word. They're living the word. Let's keep worshiping. That's worthy of worship. Let's go. Let's, let's worship the Lord some more. We manifest we show to the intent, it says, that the manifold wisdom of God, the church, the mystery, all that God's doing is made manifest to the heavenly host of the spiritual principalities and powers in heavenly places. We are on display every Sunday. 1 Peter 1.12 just tells us that angels long to look, it says, into the salvation, into the workings of God in humanity. Because salvation isn't for the angels. 
They can't be saved. Their, their allegiance has been dealt with. When Satan fell and those that stayed, they stayed with that eternal existence to worship God. They don't get to choose. They look at us. They go, wow. They get to choose and look what they're doing, how they're worshiping God. They're wanting to linger in his presence and worship God. They go, that's great. Let's keep worshiping God. Our songs, our messages, what we do together as a church is not for you. It's for us and it's for the revelation of what God's done in us to the heavenly hosts. We're put on display. There is more taking place in these gatherings than online than just us coming together. There is a spiritual working that happens when the church gets together. Don't miss it. Don't lose out with this understanding of what the church is all about. That's the promise and the purpose, but let me give you the power. How does this happen? Verses 14 to 19. For this reason I pray, bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus from the whole from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. And he starts off this prisoner. He says he's a steward, he's a minister, and now he's a worshiper. He bows his knees. And if there's an example we need as we look at Paul's life as a carrier of this mystery, as a preacher of this mystery, as a planter of churches, we can't do any of it without the presence of God. We can shout all we want. We can give all we want. We can... Do whatever we want and make a loud noise. But you know, without the presence of God, the, having the love of God and having the character of God, it's just clanging brass. But when we have the presence of God, that's what makes this church function and fulfill its calling. He becomes a worshiper. He's totally dependent. He leads by example. This aspect of humility, earlier he said, I'm the least of all the saints. I'm the least, I'm the smallest, I'm the, the worst. Of, like, earlier he called himself in Scripture, he says, I'm the chief of sinners. You go, Paul, what do you mean chief of sinners? Well, let's put it in perspective. Paul killed Christians. He says in one place that he did everything he could to convince Christians to blaspheme God and curse and then die. And yet the grace of God came to Paul there on the Damascus Road. So Paul says, I, I'm the chief of sinners. That's not a false humility. That's reason how, reasoning of how far he was away from God, and yet God saved him. He says, because of that, I have one call, and that's to share the wealth of the riches of Christ with others. And Paul says for believers, as he simply closes out, he says simply this, I'm going to pray for you, he says, and I want you to pray these things, but it's not just pray for, it's pursue after. And here's the challenge for you and I today. We got chapter one, we understand that. Chapter two, okay, got it. But what are we going to do with all that? And here's, here's what he's telling us, to be the church. This is us, to be this church. Paul says, I want you to pray for these th four things. Number one, pray for strength, Ephesians 3.16 that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through the Spirit in the inner man. The church needs to function in the Holy Spirit. Don't function in any charisma of man. Don't function in any, any situation or finances or building. or Don't do any of that unless you have the power of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 1.8, Jesus said, I want you to tarry, I want you to wait until you're endued from on high by the power of the Holy Spirit. You'll receive power from on high. Something that you can't do on your own. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, when the early church was birthed, the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost, and that filling began to happen. There was a pouring out of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 10, verse 38, it talked about Jesus as the example. He went about doing good. It says healing all who were sick because he was anointed with the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't do anything without the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to pray and pursue after the power of the Spirit. And it, it goes on, he says, it, it comes into the inner man, the inner part of the spiritual being. And it tells us this, that we can't have the power of the Holy Spirit simply by natural pursuit. It's a spiritual pursuit. It's not where we get it once and for all. We get it continually. The disciples were constantly being filled with the Spirit. Why? Because we 
bleak? No, because we pour it out. We heal people. We strengthen people. We encourage people. We give to people. We're fighting the good fight of faith. So we need to be filled again and again and again, strengthened in the inner man. Pray for and pursue the strength that comes by the Holy Spirit. Number two, pray for depth. Ephesians 3.17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. Three pictures, he says, dwell, rooted, grounded. This is maturity. This is where we go from beyond being babes in Christ. We become mature. We grow up. The Bible constantly is saying, grow up. Grow up in Christ. Put away the childish things. To dwell means you, you, you live comfortably at home with the presence of God. Not comfortably, but there's such an association with God. You know God. You hear his voice. You understand his voice. You dwell with. Then it goes on, and he says that you are rooted. Your roots go so deep, you pull in the nourishment and stability that only happens with deep roots. And then you're grounded. It means that you've got a firm foundation. You're unshakable, unmovable. That's maturity. God's calling us into maturity to be that church God can use. Thirdly, pray for apprehension. Ephesians 3, 18, 19 says that you may be able to comprehend or apprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, the height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. And as your pastor, I cry that you would grasp the love of God. Get a hold of it. Don't just take it as some nice relationship. Do you know how much God loves you? Do you know the height, the length, the breadth, the, the, the width of his love for you, where he'll go for you, what he'll do for you? Because when you get a hold of his love, God can use you to give it away. Get a hold of the love that knows your past, present, future, and that he's working with you constantly. Pray for it. Pursue after it. And lastly, pray for fullness. He starts and he ends with the power of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 3.19b says that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. If I had a bucket here and full of water, I'd fill it, fill it, fill it. And you guys say, yeah, that's full. I go, well, it's not full. I'd fill it a little more. You see, until the, it gets that cusp, you know how the water forms that cusp? I mean, as a little, as a little child, I, I was known as spilling my milk all the time. I'd want to pour the milk myself. You know, there I'm three, four, five. I'm just going to pour it. And back then we had these weird buckets, even bags in little containers. How many remember the milk in a bag? And You know, like, there's no stability in a bag. Of course a three-year-old's going to spill it. But I wanted to fill it, right? So I'd fill it and, and just get full. And then I'd, I'd just be dripping it. Drip, 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 drip. Until finally, finally, poosh, it f overflows, right? And mom would just be after me like crazy. Do you have that kind of fullness that it overflows in your life? Or you just have enough? God says, go for the fullness. Go so that you minister out of the overflow, so that it's more than enough in you that others can have what you've got. Your, your spouse and your children, uh, your neighbors, your workplace, they, you've got so much in you, it's overflowing that everybody's getting, getting soaked by what's inside of you. Paul says, go after the fullness. Get a hold of all that God has for you. So there's to the rim and nothing wanting. You and I is, can be this church. And I believe as we look at these three chapters and we say, this is us. We don't say, oh, that can't be us. No, go, no. We go, this is us. Yeah, this is us. This is what we aspire to. This is what we want. We want to be not just those that are in Christ that are dead and now made alive, just a graveyard people that are all of a sudden now together in a community. No, we, we influence the people around us with the very unsearchable riches of Christ that we get to hold on to. We share it. We give it. He ends with this doxology, and we use this. We like, we like this verse. I want you to understand the context of it. Now to him that is able, that is able to do all, above all, abundantly above all, exceedingly abundantly above all. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all. That we ask or think, we go, God, that's my God. And we love that. Let's, let's hold on to it. That's a beautiful promise. Pray it. Use it. Let faith build up inside of you. But notice the next verse. And... To him be all glory, thank you, in the church. 
the context of this beautiful prayer, this doxology of worship to God, is centered back in with the glory being in the church. You and I, this church, every church. God wants to pour this into us, to all generations, forever and ever. Chapters 1, 2, and 3 that we just nailed down is like, wow, this is us. And we should be shouting yes. You get into the car, you say to whoever's with you, yes, this is us. And this is what we aspire to. This is what we're going after. This is what God is calling the church to be. Paul brings everything, everything back to the church. Pastor, you seem pretty encouraged about the church. I really am. Thanks for asking. I'm excited about our church. I'm excited about all the churches. I'm excited about what God's doing right now, here today. You go, man, I don't know, churches are shut down and different things are happening and, you know, and uh, it's awkward situations out there. And Really? Really? Yeah, really. I'm excited about what God's doing in this church. I'm excited about the relationships that are being built. You go, well, how are we building a relationship? We don't even see and talk to each other. You know why? Because we're in Christ. That you might not know each other personally in their names, but because they're in Christ, they're sitting here with you, we are building something bigger than ourselves. That when you come and you worship, when you gather together as a group, angelic beings, those on the dark side and those on the non-dark side, they're all going, whoa, this is incredible. Something is happening when we gather together as a church. So don't stop. Don't give in to the acclamation of this world today that it's, let's just be comfortable. Let's just wait it out. There ain't no waiting out. The church is on the move. The church is advancing. The church is building. The church is reaching. The church is changing lives. Come on, the church is seeing hearts and lives being turned over. We're seeing marriages touched. We're seeing lives all of a sudden coming together that were hurt and disencouraged. And they're finding peace. They're finding the hope. Why? Because that's what the church does. We're not in a pause waiting for something to be over. Christ is building his church. Christ is moving forward. And we're part of that church. Come on, get excited about it. Go over these chapters. Go over these verses. And begin to just call out every time, this is us. Husband, wife, this is us. Family, this is us. This is who we are. And watch what God will do in our church. Watch what God will do in your home and your family, your marriages, your kids. Be the church your family needs. Can I just say that? Be the church your family needs. Be the church your marriage needs. Be the church that your neighbors need. Because we might be the only ones they have. Let's stand. Father, we thank you today. God, we thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that it is spirit and truth. God, that your word is not only truth, that it can do what it says it can do. It has the power to do it. So, Lord, we pray over these verses today, the scriptures today, the understanding of this church. God, we say this is us. Unashamedly, boldly. God, we stand we say confidently, Lord, this is us. We thank you for what you're doing in the church today in Jesus' name. Let's, let's worship him and let's give the Satan and all his minions something to be scared about as they watch the church today. Amen. Amen. Let's sing this together. I am chosen, not forsaken. Oh, I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. Yes, I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. Oh, I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. Yes, I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. Oh, I 
child of God, yes I am. Amen. Well, it's a really a privilege that we can come together and worship, hear the word, and encourage one another. Go in God's grace. Go with the Lord. The Lord will go with you. He'll guide you, lead you. If we can pray for anything, if we can encourage you in any way, as we dismiss, come. There's leaders here that would love to be able to pray with you, stand with you, agree with you. God's called us to be a body to encourage one another. Hey, God bless you. We'll see you on Sunday. Stay connected as much as you can with our Zoom classes and be with one another. God bless you. We'll see you next Sunday.